God says, I'm not moving until you get so upset with your circumstance that you're willing to cry out and when you call on me, I will answer. What if I told you that a cry is the signal to God that I'm ready to be delivered? And the enemies that we see today, we shall see no more. I need every Moses online and every Moses in this building to shout, we are coming out. Have your way in this place today. Whatever you want done, we submit our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto you, which is our reasonable service. Thank you that great is thy faithfulness. In Jesus' name we pray. If you love the Lord, say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Second Chronicles chapter 29, verse 3. And to contribute to the brevity of time, I'm just going to start reading. The Bible says he, in the first year of his reign, in the first month, opened the door of the house of the Lord and repaired them. And he brought in the priests and the Levites and gathered them together into the east street and said unto them, Hear me, ye Levites, sanctify not yourselves and sanctify the house of the Lord God of your fathers and carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place. So what is going on prior to this guy, Hezekiah, being king, his father Ahaz was the king. And Ahaz had turned Israel away from worship. Are you with me so far? And so Hezekiah assumes the throne and he takes over where his father left off. His father closed the doors to the temple. Hezekiah actually preached this sermon before I wrote it and the name of the subject is according to the action that Hezekiah did when he received the throne. You've all heard this statement before, but I'm hoping to give you new revelation on it. Look at your neighbor and say, Pastor wants to talk about the doors of the church are open. Yeah, you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. The doors of the church are open. How many of you all have been in church long enough to remember when that was how the pastor ended every sermon? After he said he died on Friday, I'm going to test your church knowledge. He stayed in the grave all night, Friday night. All day. Look at some of them like, what? Is it the weekend? <laughs> all day, Saturday. All night. Saturday night. I'm about to find out how saved you are. But. <laughs> I didn't know we all went to the same church. Early Sunday morning. I ain't done testing you. He got out of the grave. Not with just some power, but power to make you walk right. Power to make you talk right. B minus. <laughs> Until now, I thought, <laughs> that it was a church colloquialism that we just used at the end of the message just to say the doors of the church are open and, and we would open the doors of the church but what it really meant is that we had come to the part of the service where you could respond to the message and you can come and join the church. I'm testing your knowledge. But you could come by letter, by Christian experience, or through baptism. So I grew up in the day in church 
where if you left a church, you have to get a letter from the church you were at. And you had to bring that letter to the church you were trying to join. And we didn't join church in the gym. No, they put chairs across the altar. And you have to sit in that chair and there'd be a secretary who wasn't allowed in the pulpit. Church, we have Ella Jean Smith coming to us from the Beulah Baptist Church of Georgia. She was the ministry leader at her church and she comes through Christian experience. At our church, we had other things say, how do we treat her? Everybody was saying, we welcome you. We welcome you once. We welcome you twice. We welcome you. <laughs> that was our experience every Sunday. Not only was that our experience every Sunday, but Oh, back then, you didn't just go to church at 10. No, 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 no. You had to be there at 8 o'clock for Sunday school. And we had this little wooden board on the wall. It said, this Sunday, $326. Last Sunday, $422. There was a lady with a folder tabulating all the manila envelopes. And the women's ministry would always win. That was the church that I grew up in. That church in its practices doesn't exist much anymore. The church has always been under attack. That's why Jesus had to say, upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. 2020 comes and COVID look like the gates of hell. Because here Jesus was in antiquity saying that the gates of hell should not prevail against it, and yet for a season it looked like the doors of the church were closed. Whether you know it or not, every Sunday, while all of you all were at home, myself and a consortium of people were in this room, and I stood right here. And I preached the word of God to the best of my ability as if this room was full. Because I knew that the church was still open. I only have one goal, two maybe, one primarily to let you know that this building is not the church. not the church. If Bush Airport decided that they needed this space for a runway, let, let me just tell you now. And they just so, so just so have to decide that the runway need to come right round through here. We're going to find somewhere else to go. I'm going to sell them this building at high market value. And we're going to go build another one to the glory of God. Because this ain't the church. And the proof that it is not the church is that we could lose the building and still be the lighthouse. Watch history. David wanted to build the temple for God. But God says, even though you are my favorite king, I won't allow you to be my architect because I can't have a man with blood on his hands build my building. 
So he waited a generation and built it with his son. And by the way, I didn't even plan to say this. What some of you all don't know is you're actually Solomon. What you're getting ready to do is build what your parents tried to build. And God is going to use your anointing to do what your father could not do. And it wasn't because he was weaker than you. And it wasn't because he was incapable. It just meant that God reserved the temple for your time, which means that you're not going to have to wait as long to do it because the temple has actually been waiting on you to grow up before it would go up. Touch somebody say, I've got a Solomon's anointing. COVID tried to close the doors of the church and we passed out more masks and hand sanitizer and we practiced social distancing to the best of our ability. But look at us now. Because the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Y'all ready to go? Death brought Hezekiah to the throne. Ahaz had to die first in order for Hezekiah to assume the throne. See, this is something you've got to get because death is required for life. Most of us never assume our kingly or queenly positions is because we don't know when to pronounce a thing dead. And so here you are. Trying to breathe life into something that God said it must end for you to start. You will never be in your future and your past at the same time. You have to decide, either I'm going to be who I was or I'm going to be who I am supposed to be. And a double-minded man is unstable in, touch your name and say, make up your mind, make up your mind. Make up your mind. Make up your mind. When Ahaz died, the Bible says that his death was welcomed. You didn't hear what I said. Can, can I just take my time? And it's his death was welcomed, which means that when he died, Israel was like, we've been waiting. Do you know how many people who are waiting on you to fail. <laughs> waiting on you. And, they, and this, is, this is how you know. They say stuff like, well, it's just your season. What they mean is, I hope you only win for this short amount of time. And they're hoping that your season ends so theirs can begin. I don't know if you know this. But the kind of anointing that a great man or a great woman has works in any season. <laughs> Do me a favor, tell your neighbor, I'm here, I'm here. And, I ain't going I ain't going I ain't going and I ain't going nowhere. I ain't going nowhere. I'm blessed, and that's the way it's going to be. I'm highly favored, and that's the way it's going to stay. <laughs> yeah, keep saying it, because you got to speak it if you're going to see it. Bishop Ahaz died, and his death was welcome. Why was his death welcome? Because the Bible says that he replaced the presence of the Lord with idols. Just, just think about this. They went from worshiping God to worshiping idols because any time we can't get God to do what we want him to do, we build something that will listen to us. It's like a person who thinks they're right. They have to keep looking for somebody 
to validate the perspective. And even though nine people told him they were wrong. See, they agree. That just means two fools are on the same page. That's, this is what Nebuchadnezzar did to affix the Hebrew boys to turn away from God. He says, right, I'm going to build this golden image. And he says, if you don't bow to it, I'm going to throw you into the fiery furnace. What did the Hebrew boys say? They said, listen, we will not bow. And if you have to throw us into the fire, I'm paraphrasing, do it because our God is well able to protect us in the fire. What did Nebuchadnezzar do? He threw them into the fire. Turned up the heat seven times hotter, trying to bake them quicker. Went on about his business, was waiting on the report to find out how quickly they had burned up. They came and gave him a report and said, uh, King, them dudes made out of something else. Because we turned up the fire seven times harder, and they walking around in the fire. We opened the door, sniffed them, and they didn't even smell like smoke. Their hair wasn't burned up. Their clothes didn't have any scars on it. And the only thing that burned up in the fire was the ropes we wrapped around them. Can I tell you that sometimes the fire ain't for you, it's for the stuff. Touch somebody say, this fire gonna burn up the ropes. This ain't about your heart. This ain't about your mind. This ain't about your sin. This ain't about your relationship. God's trying to burn up the stuff that got you wrapped up. So like Lazarus, you can come walking out of. Oh, and by the way, they said, didn't we throw? <laughs> Didn't we throw three, one for the father, one for the son. Didn't we, didn't we throw three men in the fire? Yes, we did. Well, I see another man. And he looks like, oh, don't y'all make me get happy. Like the son of God. Touch somebody and say, he walks with me. He talks with me. He t I'm not by myself. If God be for me, that's too early. Bishop, you're supposed to not let me shout that loud that early. I ain't been preaching for five minutes. The enemy is trying to destroy worship. Worship has benefits that you can't even think about. The first thing Ahaz does is he destroys the priesthood. Now, you have to understand that the priesthood is, is didactic, it's dual. It, it had a two-fold perspective. There was one priesthood according to the order of a man named Melchizedek. And that priesthood was about receiving the Holy Ghost and the baptizing of the new convert and worshiping God. So he, he destroyed the priesthood of, the, of Melchizedek, but then there was the Aaronic priesthood. So he destroys the priesthood. What is a priest? One who stands in the gap between God and man. So what he does is he destroys the intercessor, God. So you got to understand, if you are a prayer warrior, because some of y'all families are still alive because you pray. So what you got to understand is when you are a prayer warrior, you are under surveillance and under attack. Now, I can just put it right here. How many mamas pray for their babies every night? See, you got to understand, when you're praying for anybody who has the potential to make it, the devil wants to stand in the gap and destroy the person who holds the gap. You better hear what I'm telling you. So what Ahaz does is he destroys the priesthood because if I can remove the priest, then I, I remove the intercession. So now when I pray because I sin, God can't stand sin. So I destroyed the person who stands in between sin and man so that the retribution of the sin can go directly to man. God says, Satan, you think you're going to outsmart me? 
You can destroy the priesthood, but I got another plan at Calvary. I'm going to become the high priest. Oh, y'all ain't here with me. And try to kill me if you want to. Try to get in between. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and there was nothing made that was made without Him. So now He becomes the high priest. And now we don't have to go into a confessional and in a booth to tell another man who got the same issues about my issues. I can now go to God in my filth and say, Father, I stretch my hands to thee. No other help I know if thou withdraw thyself from me. Can I tell you something that religious people ain't gonna like? You can come to Jesus just. All right, I came to Jesus just as I was. I was weary, worn, and sad. I found in him a resting place, and he has made me glad. I don't care if you got to stumble to him. I don't care if you come with your eyes bloodshot red and hot. I don't care if you came out of the wrong bed last night. Come unto me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you. But see, there are people who want to close the doors of the church, and they only want the people who are good to be in. Oh, you know what I'm talking about. They only want the people who know the hymns and, and, the, and the ladies who have the long skirts. And God forbid you wear a skirt that's a little short, they're going to judge you. But see, let me tell you something. To all of y'all who ever came to church and got judged, the people who judging you, they wear the same outfit when they go to Vegas. They just don't wear it to church. They be, in, they be on a strip just trying to get chose and then come in here and judge you. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I got one sentence. The doors of the church are open. Bring your mini skirt, bring your purple hair, bring your tattoos, bring your drugs, bring your weed, because we're going to lay it on the altar, and God is going to start to transform your life. And before I take it back, I'll add more to it. Cast your cares on him because he cares for you. The problem that we have in our modern dispensation is that we have made the church a social club only for the cool kids in the clique who know how to speak in tongues and who know how to shout and who know how to dress. But there is room at the cross. I said there's room at the cross for you. I believe that. I may be in a minority. I just believe that you can come as you are. You just don't have to leave like you came. Watch this. It's a system. Watch this. He destroys the labors. This is his system. You got to watch Ahaz. This guy was slick. What he did was he destroyed the labors. Let me explain to you. Bring up what a labor is if you got one. There, there is a labor. This was filled with water, so the priest would have to wash his hands and feet in it so that when he went to go pray, he was ceremonially clean because you could not enter into the temple. Oh, thank you, Jesus. See, when you walked in the dirt, it didn't matter if you were dirty out there. But in order to come in the temple, you had to be clean, right? So, so, so they had to be ceremonially clean. It didn't take away their sins. It was a ceremony. You better hear me. It was a ceremony because even the people who were washing their hands still had dirty hearts. So, 
So it was a ceremony, and, and they had to come. But he didn't even want that, so he broke all of the labors. So now you have no priesthood. And you have no ceremonial cleanliness. Are y'all still tracking with me? So he destroys all of that, and then he closes the doors of the church. So now, nobody is in the temple, and they've turned away from God, and they built golden images, and the Bible says that at least for the Israelites, when they were building golden images, the Bible says that they all chipped in by giving their earrings to the temple. See, watch this. It was only big because everybody was in it. See, because anything you give your ear to grows. See, some of y'all think you ain't doing nothing wrong because all I did was listen. But you got to understand that when you listen, it affects the way you think. And when it affects the way you think, it affects the way you talk. And when it affects the way you talk, it affects what you receive. There are some things that you have to understand that even though you are mature, you ought to refuse to listen to. Ah, oh, y'all ain't gonna say amen. Because see, we think, well, I didn't do nothing. All I did was listen. You are not loyal if you let somebody sit around you and talk about your friend and all you did was listen. What she should have said is, that's my friend. I'm gonna tell him exactly what she said and you lucky you still got teeth in your mouth because the way we roll. See, y'all ain't loyal. Y'all will listen to anybody, say anything about anybody. And then when you get around, I'm talking about, see, that's what I was saying. You didn't say nothing. All you did was give your earrings. Come to me and say, Pastor, I'm going to tell you about Bishop Sion. It ain't, it ain't going down. It just ain't going down. You can't tell me nothing. And if you tell me something that's true, if I do have to deal with it, I ain't going to do it in front of you. Because the next thing you got to understand is that just because you got an issue with somebody doesn't mean it's everybody's to see. I know this ain't part of the sermon, but where is the loyalty? Where is the trustworthiness? Where is the stuff that if we, if we spend time together, where is it that I know I got somebody protecting me outside of my presence? Where, where are the loyal people? If you're loyal, holler at your boy. I know you, I know, man, come here, man. Let me shake your hand. I already know. Right on. <laughs> I already know. I already know. I already know. I already know. Sarge ain't sat down in 13 years. He's been standing right there every sermon. <laughs> Bishop, there's no priest. I know you know this. Raymond, I know you know this. If there is no priest, see, who went to God for the people? Priests did. We talked about it. So what happens? If there is no priest, there is no healing. If the order of Melchizedek was, that's why we bless babies, because according to the order of Melchizedek in the priesthood, you would bless the children. That's what happened to Eli. Remember when Hannah took her son? To be blessed, it's actual biblical thing to bring your children to the altar. Remember, he was walking around the house. The Lord said, Eli, Eli said to the priest, did you call me? He says, he calls his name again. Did you call me? It was until the fourth time that he understood what God was saying. But his mama brought him to the house of God because eventually when God calls your name, you'll know it's him. He destroys the priesthood. So now nobody's getting healed. No deliverance. The children are not being blessed for a thousand generations. And everybody's at home just suffering. Because he destroyed the priesthood and he destroys the labors, which eventually contributes to the destruction of the entire temple. I want you to bring up the temple, how it looked under the 
the leadership of Ahaz. Because, now what, let's do this first. Bring up the temple as it looked when Solomon built it. Solomon said, I want everything to be gold because silver is not good enough for God. I want y'all to hear me. Now, this is the temple that David tried to build. God wouldn't let him. He let Solomon do it. Solomon built the, y'all not listening. He built the whole thing out of gold. The, if they had today's dispensation, this would have been gold. This would have been gold. This would have been gold. The bathroom faucets would have been gold. The toilets would have been gold. Everything was made out of gold. And he said, no silver in my daddy's house. Are y'all not listening? He builds this temple, and the first thing that he does to ensure its success is to relocate the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant is the representation of the presence of God. He put it in the holies of holies. And only on the Day of Atonement could Aaron, the Aaronic priesthood, go behind the veil and atone for the sins of the world. How did he do that? Through blood sacrifice. And even the altar was made out of gold. The lampstands, made out of gold. The table of showbread, made out of gold. Everything in the temple was made out of gold because gold represents divinity. Gold represents God in the scripture. That's why the Ark of the Covenant was gold on the outside, wood in the middle, and gold on the inside. Why? Because gold represents God, wood represents flesh. That's why Isaiah said that the decay of the shittim wood is representative of the flesh. So the Ark of the Covenant, three layers, gold, wood, gold, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And the golden lampstand that gave light to the temple was made out of one piece of gold. Even though it had seven extensions, it was hammered out of one piece of gold. Why? Because there was one Lord. Y'all in Bible class right now. One faith and one baptism. Do me a favor. I'm just going to go on and teach. Tell your neighbor, there's only one God. There's only one God. There's only one God. We are not a monotheistic people. Excuse me, polytheistic people. We are not a polytheistic people. Poly meaning many. Polygraph, many lies. We are a monotheistic people. Mono, one. We got one Lord. That's why there's no way to the Father except by him. Now, I know it sounds polytheistic because there is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but the three are one. He is not three gods. He is one God acting in three different persons. So when he created the world, he was Father. When he raised us from the dead, he was Son. And now he's walking with us as the Holy Ghost. But all three are one. He's at the right hand of the Father, yet he is the Father. Yet he's in this room, and yet he's everywhere at the same time. And if it's confusing to you, remember this. His ways are not your ways. And his thoughts are far above your thoughts. God is the only one who could be both prophet priest and king all at the same time, yet he was God and became man and tabernacled amongst us, but he never left heaven. And while he was dying on the cross, he was still on the throne. And while he was in the grave dead, he was still alive because he did not faint. He actually did die, yet he was still living. And when he rose up out of the grave, he did not ask for permission. He told himself, self, it's time to get up. How do I know he can do it? Because when he was creating, he talked to himself. Let us create man in our image and after our likeness. And the old song says, all three make one. And while he is 100% man. He's still 100% God. And while he was sitting next to his father, he was descending like a dove. And while he was being baptized in the Jordan River, he turned around and said, this is my beloved son 
in whom I'm well pleased. He's the puppet master, pulling all of the strings at the same time, healing the land and cursing the land, bringing down the rain and causing the famine because he's God all by himself. So Ahaz, that's who you up against. And you trying to close the doors of the church to a man and a spirit who can be both at the same time. And the people are frustrated because they're saying, I remember the glory days of Solomon. I remember when the temple was made out of gold. Show the temple in the days of Ahaz. Now the temple is destroyed. The people are fighting. They're stealing the artifacts. That's the golden lampstand. Some people who called themselves friends are now being thrown overboard. Yeah. Everybody's fighting. The temple is in disarray. And if the truth is the truth, this is really a picture of denominational conflict. The Baptists don't like the Kojic. Kojic don't like Pentecostal. Now everybody's running away from the denominations and they love to proudly say, I go to a non-denominational church. Hush your mouth because your non-denominational church ain't nothing but another denomination of people who decided to do things the same way. God said, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't create Baptists. I, I didn't create Methodists. I didn't create Pentecostalism. I created the church. I created the church and I filled it with my glory. And I filled it with my presence. And I filled it with myself as such that when the service goes on and the minister can't preach, everybody's not shocked walking away saying, we had one of them services where the pastor couldn't preach. God says, I'm looking for it to be a regular occurrence. That every time you come in church, it has the potential to flip in such a way that God can take over the room and do with it whatever he decides to do. I don't care if it's first Sunday, second Sunday, third Sunday, fourth Sunday, or fifth Sunday, every day is the day of Thanksgiving. And every time you get in your car and you drive here, you need to be saying, I entered into his gates with thanksgiving, and I entered into his courts with praise. Can I help you? You should be praising before praise starts. Yeah. This is the truth. How many of y'all, let's be honest, you just sitting back like, ooh, that ain't really my favorite song, but okay. Which means you're reacting to the music and not to the God that the music is about. You should never get excited about the song. You should get excited about the person the song is directed to. When I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, that's enough right now to flip this building upside down and for you to begin to worship the Lord. Watch this, in spirit. Sp speaking of spirit and in truth, it just hit my spirit right now. There's a pastor in Atlanta, Georgia. His name is Pastor Mark Moore. The name of his church is called Spirit and Truth. And Pastor Mark, I was, I was looking online on Instagram. I talked to my wife about this yesterday. We were looking on Instagram, and we saw that you were trying to build a church. And we saw half of your ceiling had been refinished and the other half had not been. And you were raising money. And I think that I heard that you had about $14,277 left so that your church can have church on Easter. I want to let you know that money will be in your bank account on Monday morning. All because we are the church of Jesus Christ. 
Touch somebody, say, help me build the temple. You will have it. We're trying to build something. We're going to sow into what you're finishing. It is no secret what God can do. What he's done for others, he will do for you. I want to find the people who want the temple to be open. Oh, no. I didn't say your local building. I didn't say your grandmama church. I said, who wants the temple open? I don't care what I got to do. I'm going to help open the doors of the church. Not the lighthouse. I said the church of Jesus Christ. Let me start by saying this. I'm going to be done. When he started building the church again, he didn't start with the youth ministry. See, see that's, if, if, let's be honest, right now, in this dispensation time, people want to know, what y'all got for the kids? You don't never have nobody interviewing the church talking about, how's the worship? What they got for teens? Y'all got a singles ministry? Y'all got men's ministry? Y'all got, y'all got, y'all got, y'all got. And, and this is what's happening to the church. I said this yesterday on our meeting. We went from service to customer service. We, we went from being glad that they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord to, I don't like their website. Mm. Look at that, y'all, there go that church mouse. He started with worship. because you were created. Help me, Holy Spirit, to worship. And he opens the doors of the church, and the Bible says, and he repaired them. Watch this. How many of y'all ever gone in somebody's house, they don't go out a lot, and I'm not being facetious, this is true, and you walk in some people's house and you just got a smell. Say they ain't gonna say y'all ain't gonna raise your hand, but they like. Mm -hmm. so I know, I know people's like that. And from those of y'all who are not, see, we don't have these in Houston, but I'm from the Midwest. We have basements. Let me tell you something. Every basement smells the same. You can just smell water when you walk in the basement. When, when, be honest with you. When y'all wasn't here and this place was closed. We had to make sure that we kept it fumigated and irrigated because when the doors of a building don't open, the air stay. You see where I'm going, Tony. Actually, it's called stale. Stale air. Now, most of y'all, when you hear the word stale, it, it don't mean that, that your flaming hots ain't crunchy. I mean, th these, these Cheerios are stale. Oh, no. <laughs> stale by definition means not fresh and unpleasant. So when the doors of the church were closed, the air was stale. Why? Because when there is no HVAC, when the air doesn't move, carbon builds up attaches to moisture and the room becomes stale and it has a stench. So what happened when Ahaz closed the doors, it started to stink in church. And the reason why it stunk in church is because all of the air in it was old and they didn't want no new people, I mean new air. This us church. They didn't want whoremongers and thieves and robbers in the church. All they wanted was Pharisees and Sadducees. So the air was stale. God says, not my church. So watch what God does 
in Acts chapter 2 to open the doors of the church. And when Pentecost had fully come, there was the sound of a mighty rushing. The reason why God opened the church with wind is because God says, I'm tired of this stinking atmosphere. And I'm fanning out all of this stench because I want my worship to get to my nostrils and be a sweet smell. I don't know who I'm talking to in this place today, but I got a word from God. You ready? God told me to tell you, the wind is coming. The wind is coming. Oh, I'm going to talk to y'all over here. The wind is coming. There is something in your life that has been decaying and dead and it stinks. And God says, I'm about to send a fresh wind. I'm about to shake up things for you. And I'm about to change the smell of your circumstance. Give three people a high five and say, the wind is coming. The wind is coming. The wind is coming to my house. It's coming to my marriage. It's coming to my job. It's coming to my creativity. Slap somebody and say, the wind is coming. Some of y'all been in the same position for the last five years. All of a sudden, you're going to feel a wind just pushing you into your destiny. Ask your neighbor, can you feel that at your back? That's the wind of God telling you that you're almost to your destiny. I need about 500 people to shout, there's a wind coming. There's a wind coming. There's a wind coming. Look for somebody who ain't looking ashy. Tell them a wind is coming, a wind is coming, a wind is coming. If you ain't too scared, find somebody who looks like they got purpose. Just kind of push them in their back and say, that's a wind. That's a wind. That's a wind. That's a wind. That's what God's about to do. He's about to send somebody who will give you a little assistance and push you into your destiny. Somebody shout wind, 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 wind. God's about to shake it up. I said, God's about to shake it up. When you go in your job, the wind is coming. When you get to your house, you going with a fresh wind. When you go to fill out the application, you going with the wind. When you go to the bank to get the new house, you going with the wind. Somebody shout, going with the wind. There's a wind coming. There's a wind coming. You're going to be walking, and all of a sudden... What? Right now, right now your pace is about a two-year pace to get where you're going. And God going to wait just until you don't have... Thank you, Holy Ghost. I declare in the next season of your life, you're going to get whiplash. Ooh. You're going to get whiplash. I'm telling you right now, God's about to push you into the next dimension. Somebody shout, wind. Why would he call you an eagle if you didn't need wind? If you ever seen an eagle at its best, eagles are not flapping all day long. That's what pigeons do. Because when you live low, you got to fly like hell to stay afloat. But when you get on eagle's wings, somebody shout, I'm soaring into the next dimension. I'm soaring into the next level. I'm soaring into the next atmosphere. Somebody shout, wind, wind, wind. There's a wind coming. I know what I'm talking about. This wind gonna have you, your babies, your mama, your sisters, your cousins, Earl, Craig, Shayla, Pookie, Nene.
There's a wind coming. It's a wind. All of a sudden, clients that you didn't even expect. What? Your QuickBooks about to start going off. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> Your Stripe account about to tell you we're gonna have to raise the rate on you because you're bringing in too much. That's for you. Well, it's for you. Take it. Just zails out of nowhere. Pow! Yeah. Cash out. Ding! Vimo. Pop! <laughs> Listen. But if you don't open your doors, you won't experience the wind. Because some of y'all want the wind, but you're so closed off. You like to stay to yourself. You don't like people. You an introvert. <laughs> you no, know, so many people talking about the introvert. You ain't no introvert. You just selfish and standoffish, and you don't trust people. And that is not the definition of introvert. I don't trust people because when I was in elementary, they stole my pizza. I don't trust men because I seen how they did my mama. And here you are with a man that don't intend you to do like your mama's man did you, but if you keep acting like it's happening to you, it's gonna happen to you because you are bracing for an accident that wasn't gonna happen. And when you brace for an accident that wasn't gonna happen, you end up having it because you were braced for it. It's closed off. I don't. You got women around, I don't like women. You a woman and you don't like women. Now how you a woman and don't like women and then tell men we supposed to like you too? Y'all make up your mind. All the fellas like, yeah, dog, say that, cuz. That's what I'm talking about, man. I ain't, that's why I go to this church, man. Thank you for bringing me here, baby. My wife don't tear me up out there. She said, you up there acting crazy. <laughs> Sorry, baby. <laughs> you got to open the doors. Don't listen to Teddy P. <laughs> Teddy P going to keep you out your blessing. Okay, I'm coming back. All right, I'm coming. Okay. All right. I'm sorry. My fault, Keon. I'm coming back. All right. All right, okay. Oh, the doors. <laughs> he repaired the doors. What do doors represent? You, have you ever asked? It, it must be, Melba, it must be something important because Jesus then says, I am the door. So if he's willing to accept the nomenclature, then there must be something special about doors. If you study it, since I'm almost done, <laughs> doors represent agreement. So not only is a wind coming, but there is an agreement coming. God is about to make an agreement with you. 
And if God says it, it shall come. I know what I'm talking about. I have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor have I ever seen the seed begging bread. If God said it, you can count on it. Tony said it earlier, I live by this statement, God always ends in well done. So if all ain't well, God ain't done. He always ends in well done. Doors represent agreement. Revelations 3 and 8 says, I have set before you an open door. Baby, when I read this, it killed me. I promise you. I couldn't get this out of my head. How many of y'all know that sometimes we say scriptures, but we quote them like we remember them, but we're not actually quoting them the way God wrote them? And if you just quote what you think you remember, you're going to miss the point because you got to say what God said. I have set before you a what? No. That's what I've been saying my whole life. Bring up Revelation chapter 3, verse 8. I'm going to wait on it. Revelation chapter 3, verse 8. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. And what? Now, how many of you all know that the Bible is a transliteration of Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic? Which means that sometimes we read it in English, but God didn't speak English. So when they were conjugating the verbs, sometimes scriptures get away from the original text, which is why you can open the NIV Bible and get a different set of words. So I went back and read it in the original. And the Bible says in Revelation chapter 3, verse 8, it says in the original language, I have set before you a door opened. That's totally different. Because if he sets before you an open door, it means that sometimes you can be walking through a door that somebody else left open. See, when you go home today, maybe you got a wife, maybe you got children, you're going to go in the bathroom, perhaps the door is open. It doesn't mean it was open for you, it just means the last person that went in there left it open when they came out. But when God says, I have set before you a door open, it meant that he actually saw you coming and said. What I'm trying to tell you is that the next door you're going to go through was one that was opened. Slap somebody and say, I got an open door. And that door was opened for. Touch three people say, open doors, open doors, open doors, open doors. That's why the Bible says, I open doors that no man can, and I shut doors that no man can. The next door that you go to will not be a door that was circumstantially opened because it was a passageway. God will literally turn the handle and open the door for Watch this. And then he will give you the key to the door. And then, doctor, he'll say this to you. Behold, I stand at the door. Because once I give you the door, then I'm going to give you permission to let me in. And all I got to say to God is, the doors of the church are open. What am I saying to God? Whatever you give me, I'll give it back to you. If you bless me, I'm going to bless. Matter of fact, I will bless the Lord at, and his praise shall continuously be in my mouth. Is there anybody in the balcony that feels like the door is opening for you?
Let me read that whole scripture. Watch this. I set before you a door opened, which no man can shut. Watch this. Because thou hast a little strength and hast kept my word and hast not denied my name. What does that mean? It means you are so, we almost gave up. But something told you, hold on. A little while longer. Any, anybody almost gave in. It was like life getting so hard. It's about to break me down. But then you heard Job say, though he slayed me, yet will I trust in him. Anybody feel the second wind coming? Tell somebody, say, I feel my help coming. I told myself I wasn't going to do all that, so let me get back to being urbane and, and together and speaking with my multisyllabic expressions and keeping myself together as an even-keeled minister of the gospel. Okay. Don't y'all make me shout. I told myself. I said, self. Myself said, hmm. I said, self, we're going to go up there and we're going to do the gospel the way God wants it done and we're going to stay... But as soon as the doors were opened, the Bible says, Hezekiah said, all right, the doors, they repaired. Tammy, he said, okay, are they, they, they open? The Bible says that he says, all right, as soon as he woke up in the morning, he went to the temple and said, it's time to worship. The drums didn't even come in from Amazon yet. <laughs> Guitar Center hadn't even sent the lead. Wasn't no, the, the, the Hammond, the B3 wasn't there yet. Pro Tools wasn't in there. Nothing was there. And he said, we're going to worship. The Bible says, early did he rise. And he worshiped. Now watch this. Oh God, I got to quit. When they start worshiping, whoa, this whoa. <laughs> whoa, when they start worshiping, the Bible says the first thing he says is, it's time for atonement. Right. See, we, we, we don't know why sometimes our worship lacks power. Because I'm going to tell you right now, there is a reason why when Paul and Silas shouted, the, the bars broke open because that means that they had a power in their worship that the average person didn't have. So how do you have bar-breaking power? How do you shout to the place that when you say God is good, stuff just starts open? Atonement. What is atonement? Atonement is the retribution are the payment given for sin. Yes. How did they atone? They would get, thank you Jesus for the word. They would get an animal, cut its throat, let the blood spill on the altar. And then they would burn it on the brazen altar because in order for sin to be atoned for, something had to die. And the thing that had to die had to be a lamb. Behold the lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. So what you see in the Old Testament concealed, we now see in the New Testament revealed because Jesus says, y'all got to have a lamb every year on the Day of Atonement. I'm going to settle all of that. I'm going to go to the cross and be the Lamb of God and let them stick me in the side and my blood is going to come streaming out and when I die one time, ain't nothing going to have to die no more because I am the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the earth. So when Jesus died, 
there was no need for another sacrifice. Because Jesus is so perfect, everything he does once is done forever. Follow me. Drink of this water, you'll never thirst again. Eat of this food, you'll never hunger again. Why? Because when Jesus does it once, it's good enough. Somebody say it's good enough. Somebody say it's good enough. So don't let nobody make you think that you're going to lose your salvation. Now this, I got to spend a few seconds on because there is no condemnation. There are a lot of people in here right now that thinks that you got to keep on going back to God saying, I'm sorry. And you do for your sins. But you, once you accept Christ, you never have to worry about your sin. Mm. Okay. Who needs more clarity? Sins, S-I-N-S, lying, Ten Commandments, thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not uh, uh, cover, I'm a jealous God, I have no other God before me. Okay, thou shalt not commit adultery. Those are the things, those are our sins. But none of those sins send you to hell. There is only one sin that can send you to hell, and that's the sin of non-belief. So when Jesus Christ died, yes, he died for sin, which means that once I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in my heart God has raised his son from the dead, yes, there is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Listen to me. When you are saved, you are always saved. Once God gets in your heart, you don't have to worry about it again. Yes, sir. I'm used to sweating. I'm good, bro. I don't grow up there. I do this. I just right around. Okay. Sin. So Jesus died on the cross. Because the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. And those whom he foreknew, he predestined. And now I am sanctified, set apart. And now I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, even though I have no righteousness in me. There is no good, even in this flesh dwelleth no good thing. Paul says, of all sinners, I am the chief. And yet with all of that, because the blood, that gives me strength. From day to day, it will never, ever lose its power. Can I see the people, as I leave you, who don't shout because you got another purse, who ain't in the bank shouting because they approved you for a car you can't afford. I want to find out, does anybody still have a shout in them because of the blood? That was, that was so, that was so cute. Give me another one. Yeah, that, that was so cute. That was so cute. That was so cute. Okay, okay. That, that sounds like you thank God that your cell phone bill got paid. I, I want you to forget about your house because it could burn out. Forget about your car because it can give out. I want you to forget about your clothes. They can wear out. It's a good one. But the blood gives me strength from day to day, and it will never lose its power.
Now, we grew up Baptist. I want to find out anybody in here who got a shout inside of you, thanking God for the blood. Come on, Lighthouse. Come on online. Somebody. I said, shout for the blood. Give your neighbor a high five and shout, neighbor. The blood still, still works. Anybody know the blood still works? I'm alive because of the blood. I survived cancer, not because of chemo, but because of the blood. I still got my mind, not because of a therapist, but because of the blood. If there's anybody here that's under the blood, I want you to rear your head back and shout over the next 30 seconds for the blood. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. The Bible says if there had been no shedding of the blood, there will be no remission of sin. Watch this. Anybody know anybody in here or you yourself have ever experienced cancer? Raise your hand. I'm about to speak a word into your life. Cancer goes into partial remission, which means that when they test you, they don't see as many cancerous cells as they did when it was aggressive. But there is another level to remission called complete remission. And complete remission means that if they don't see any cancer cells within five years, the doctor declares you to be healed. What am I saying in this place today? The reason why some of y'all patty caking is because you're just used to partial remission. But God told me to tell you that once he heals you this time, oh yeah. There's going to be complete remission. Slap your neighbor and say, this time, when I come out, I'm not going back in. When I get undepressed, you ain't going to be able to depress me again. When I get unsingle, I ain't going to be in them streets no more. When I get rich, I ain't never been broke another day in my life. Somebody shout complete remission. Good God Almighty. I want everybody who knows that God's about to do a new thing and he's about to complete what he started. I'm going to give you 30 seconds to lose your voice, lose your mind, and give God. Come on. Come on. Come on. Oh. Give me the one. Now watch this. Praise leads to remission. So if you're trying to fight off something that's trying to kill you, you can't be like, hallelujah. Devil trying to kill you, amen. Devil trying to kill your child, come on Jesus. Take the wheel. When something comes up on you like it has been coming up on you over the last 60 days, I want you to praise that devil back into complete remission. Praise the Lord in the sanctuary. Praise him with the psaltery and harp. Praise him on the timbrel and dance. Let everything... Let everything... Everything that has bread, praise the Lord. Oh, yeah! Oh, yeah! Oh, yeah! Oh, yeah! Oh, yeah! I feel an anointing. Oh, yeah! Strongholds are breaking. There's power in the name of Jesus. I hear chains falling in the spirit. I hear breakthrough. Freedom to 
tenacity, overcome, overflow, miracles, signs, and wonders. There's something about that name. There's something about that name. There's something about that name. Somebody shout Jesus. Jesus. 